Hello and welcome to part 7 of my 6502 assembly language series. Um, if you haven't seen the previous ones, um, you may want to check them out at uh, either of these locations, uh, aaron.baher.biz. Um, you can go to tag slash programming to get just the programming videos or uh, bitshoot.com. My channel is called My Dash Garden because um, I started it to do garden videos and it's gradually expanded into some other things. So should find all the videos at either of those locations. So in part seven here, we're going to be continuing on from part six, uh, debugging the code from part six, because the last time we looked at it, it crashed. And so we have to figure out why it crashes and uh, fix anything else that's wrong with it. So first thing I want to do, here's the code. I guess first I should kind of talk about how I've got this set up because things are arranged a little differently on my screen now. I've got Emacs on the left where I'm writing the code and I also have this .org file for um, notes and discussion of it. And then on the right I have the monitor. Um, I spent some time since the last video learning the, uh, the, the monitor that's built into the VICE emulator, the emulator for the Commodore 128. Um, it's quite a bit more powerful than the emulator, or quite a bit more powerful than the monitor that was built into the 128 back in 1985. Um, it's a it's a full fledged um, debugger, and so you can do things like setting breakpoints and stepping through code one line at a time, which you can't do with the old the old uh, built in monitor. So I'm going to use this one from now on. It's going to simplify some things. It also means I can skip over the step of writing programs to uh, virtual disks and then loading them with the Commodore commands. So I'm going to speed some things up. And then I also have on another window here um, the actual emulator itself, which there's nothing to see there yet. But um, And then let's see. And then I have the copy of the um, Commodore 128 programmer's reference guide. So everything ready to reference when... Uh, when we need to. So the first thing I want to do in the code here is take out all these no ops that I had put in uh, because I had put those in for um, debugging basically to have a place where we could stick in breaks and now we don't need that since we've got a better monitor. So I'll take all those out. I got them all. Okay. And now we can assemble and then go to the monitor. All right. And then we load the code in at 1300 because that's where it was saved from. And there's our code. All right. And if we try to run it, it hangs up. And then I'll have to, let's see back to it here okay so and oops, every time I let's see yeah all right so we have to figure out why it hangs and I've I thought about it or since I've been thinking about it since then I thought of a few things that might be an issue that we might need to fix um, the first one is the bank um, the Commodore 128 has what it what they call memory banks um, several different possible ones um, and the reason for that is it's a 64k machine but it came with 128k of RAM and also a bunch of different ROM chips um, with things on them like the basic and the Commodore operating system and other things like that and so you say okay well how does it how can it access more than 64k of RAM when it when it only can address that much and the way it does it is by using different RAM banks. And so depending on the bank that's selected, different things are mapped in. So if if you have like bank zero and these bank numbers only apply in basic, they, they don't apply in machine language. So we'll, we'll deal with that in a bit. But if you have, if you select bank zero, then you have only RAM and none of the internal stuff like the kernel, none of the, none of the ROMs are switched in. And so I think there's probably a there's probably a picture of this in here somewhere, and I don't know just where it would be, but um, 
basically you have layers. It's kind of like you have the ROM sits over top of RAM, and depending on whether you switch the ROM on or not, you can see through to the RAM underneath it. And so one thing I'm, I want to make sure of is that because I use a kernel routine in this code, we need to make sure the kernel is mapped in. And we can do that by setting the bank, and we'll come down here. Right here is how you decide what you're going to set the configuration register to. And basically, I'm just going to use zero because that selects everything I want. First RAM bank, um, kernel ROM, that's the one that really matters. The, the rest of them don't matter, but I'll just use zero. It also gives you the basic ROM and I.O. registers. Um, an interesting side note, the 128 was originally made so that it could have been a 256. You could have had um, another 128K of RAM added to it. I had actually bought the chips at one time for the one 128 I had. I never got around to actually doing the project, but it was actually capable of mapping um, up to 256. And I think it could even go to 512 with some other chips added too. Um, I think some people actually did that. but. Okay, so what we need to do is take zero then to set the to set the bank and put it in the configuration register, which is at fifty, which is at FF zero zero. So going back to our code, we'll go up to the very top where it starts, and load A with 0 and store it in FF00 and that will um, if I need a dollar sign on that or not that will set the bank appropriately so we have the kernel mapped in when we get down here and call um, call our print routine right here bass out okay so that was one thing I wanted to do just to be sure that that wasn't causing a problem. Okay. Now another thing is loops. Um, loops are oops. loops are always a likely place for problems to to sneak in. And we saw that before when I had this originally. I had this load X inside the loop, and so the loop was never finishing because it would set the it would reset X every time through the loop, and so it wasn't using it properly as a counter. So other loops, or you, you can also have other problems with loops, and there's a problem with this one that I'm going to demonstrate. So if we go to the monitor here, and let's set a break at 1300 at the at the beginning. Um, and then go to 1300 and then we start just whoops that wasn't what I wanted to do go to 1300 okay and we'll step through with Z and we'll see what's happening you should be able to see that the same things are happening on the on the right in the monitor that are reflected in the code on the left so at 1300 is the command to load X with 3 and then the next instruction is load A with my number comma X and my number translates to the location 1384 so you can see how on the left we have the assembler with names and with labels for things and on the right we have the actual addresses in the code in the machine code so if we continue stepping through right now you can also see the registers on the right right now A is 0 X is 3 and Y is 0 and the stack pointer is FO and uh, on the left you can you can see the the address I guess I should explain a little bit what we're seeing here for people that haven't looked at a disassembler or a, or a monitor before but um, the 1300, 1302, 1305 those are the the location that the program counter is currently at as it walks through the code and then um, the next thing you see, like this A203 right here, that's the machine code. That's the actual bits in, in memory that it's executing. And then the load X3 
is the is, is the disassembly of that so that you can say that's what this means a203 means load x with 3 and then the same thing here at 1302 you have these three values bd8413 and that translates to load a from from the location 1384 comma x all right so let's continue stepping through. This is the first time through the loop then, with x equal to 3. Then we decrement x, and branch if not equal back up to 1302, which it does. Okay, So we'll keep stepping through. We decrement x again. x is now 1, and so now we've been through the loop twice. Now we wanted to go through the loop four times. That was the point of this. We wanted to copy four values from my number because if we go down to the bottom of the code here's my number it's these four bytes which represent the number one billion I think that was the number we were dividing by or dividing um, we wanted to divide one billion by nine if I remember right um, I should have put that in a in a comment somewhere um, or no, not by nine what number was I oh no one two three four five six seven eight nine zero that's what we wanted to divide um, or we wanted to print. I'm going to put that at the top. Print 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. All right. That's the number we're, that's the number that these hex codes down here represent. And we figured that out last time. So come back up here. All right. So we're walking through this loop. We wanted to loop four times to copy those values from the location in the code in the program at my number into the dividend location which is where we're going to actually do the work on the number so let's continue stepping through this is our third time through the loop with x equal to one decrement x branch if not equal and now we've got a problem because it's already gone out of the loop it didn't branch that time because x was already down to zero but we only looped three times. And we can see that if we look at the location mine number, which is 1384. Let's look at that. There's there is the four bytes. Let's well, let's do it this way. 1384, 1387. Those are the four bytes we wanted to copy. And we wanted to copy them to C to C hundred. So if we look at C hundred to C03. We didn't copy the first one, and that's because that's because the, my loop is wrong. I'm decrementing x, but I also wanted it to happen. I, I wanted this to work four times. So I wanted it to happen with x equal to three, and then with x equal to two, and then with x equal to one, and then with x equal to zero. But because I'm branching based on this decrement of x, it never happens when x is equal to zero. It goes ahead and passes through. So basically, this this needs to be rewritten to work differently, and there's a couple different ways you could do that. You could um, you could move the decrement of x up here, like this. Started out at four, decrement it, and then you would have to do a compare x to zero here because you wouldn't be doing you wouldn't be doing your branch right after the decrement and every one of these things can mess up your your zero flag and so in this case you would say okay we're going to start out at four but we're going to decrement immediately do the work and then compare after the work is done so the first time through it would be it would be decremented so it would be three and then it would be two and then it'd be one and then it'd be zero but it would actually do the loop four times Okay, so that's one way to do it. I don't necessarily like that way. It doesn't throw me because it, it means you have to add this compare x right here. I prefer to do it this way. I, I just think it's more elegant to decrement the x and then branch on that. But if we're going to do that, that means we need to, we still need the 4 up here because we need to do it on 4, 3, 2, and 1 because it's not going to do it on 0. But because we actually want to copy from my number, we have to subtract one from both of these. So if you try to picture it and you say, okay, we want to copy from 
my number up to my number plus three since we're never going to be adding since x is never going to be zero so the first time through x is going to be three or x is going to be four so we want to we want to be offsetting from one below the location where we're going to start copying from i hope that makes sense i don't think i'm explaining it terribly well but the way this works is you're you're loading a from this location right here my number minus one plus x and since we added one up here since we've changed this from three to four we need to subtract one here so that it works out so that's the first thing um, now there's another loop down here that's the same way that's going to have the same problem exactly the same problem because of how we're copying so i'm going to do the same thing there and i think that's the only one um, this that's not a loop so I think that's the only I think those are the only ones so let's um, assemble again and then okay let's look at our code see how it looks now all right so we see the bank setting at the top now and we can see now that load We've, you know, we can see the, the change right here. Load X is being loaded with 4 now. And instead of storing into C100, comma X is storing to BFF, comma X. So we've adjusted that offset by down by 1 because X is going to be 1 larger. Okay, so that's um, one thing that had to be fixed because it wasn't getting the full 4 bytes copied. It was only copying 3 of them and ending up with a much smaller number than we were trying to divide in the first place. So let's see what happens if we jump. Okay, we still have our break there. So let's walk through this this uh, loop. So we're looping, we're going the first time through the loop with x equal to 4. Now the second time with x equal to 3. The third time with x equal to 2. The fourth time with x equal to 1. And now it should drop on out. Yeah, so now it drops on out to the next line, the load A with 10, or with A. Okay, so that fixed that. That fixed that loop. Okay. Now, the next thing to look at, and this was the one that occurred to me after I quit the last time and started thinking about this. This is actually a problem in the pseudo code, which then was reflected in the code. If you remember... Um, the way we the way we figure out whether we're done walking through the number so remember we start walking through the number from the right dividing it by 10 and then if there's anything left from the dividing it by 10 printing out the remainder or in this case pushing the remainder of the stack <clears throat> and then checking to see if what's left the the quotient is zero yet if there's anything left of the number or we've have we gone through all the digits but you'll notice here i say check if each dividend byte is zero well that's not actually correct we don't want to check the dividend we want to check the quotient because the dividend is still the original number the dividend is still one two three four five six seven eight nine ten zero we want to check the quotient and see if the quotient is now down to zero and then if it's not, then we want to you know, copy it to the dividend and do another division. And so since I wrote that wrong there, I um, coded it wrong. And so that we have a problem. So that's right here where we say check if each dividend byte is zero. That needs to be check if each quotient line byte is zero. So I'll change these. Okay, so now we're checking the right thing. We're checking the, the number that's already been divided, not the one that's still waiting to be divided. All right, so let's assemble again. Let's load again. Okay, and then go to 1300. It's going to break again. And then let's see what happens if we just let it go. All right. Return, or R-E-T, um, 
what that does in the monitor is it just lets the code go then you've been stepping through one by one it just lets the code go until it returns from something from a um, from a from a routine that you jump to normally so it came back at 13.4a so if we look at our code again 13.4a is right here so that's right after it came back from this JSR okay so what that means is the code got through you know the code got all it, it got all the way down the execution got all the way down you know through all this stuff down to here so there's no you know there's no lockups in this stuff anymore um, nothing for it to get stuck on there now let's look at the the stack because remember we, we pushed all the digits on the stack so look at that there they are there's the digits on the stack except for one and that's probably because yeah that's because this right here is a return address and so that got pushed on in between so we might still have an issue but I'm, I'm not sure um, okay so let's take out our break or let's view the breaks first delete the first one and then go to 1300 okay we're still getting stuck on something or it just finishes I'm not sure oh wait a second I've got a I'm not looking at the right thing uh, back to this okay let's go to the okay so it is breaking out at a strange location so there is something odd going on so we'll go back to our better monitor here okay so it is getting down to at least the first um, print and it's getting our our digits although now now they're a little messed up so you can still see some of them there but some of them have been clobbered <clears throat> so not sure why that is let's figure that out okay so I guess the thing to do let's put our break back in and go whoops that's not what I wanted go to 1300 start stepping then return okay so we're back back out at 13.4a um, y is still set y is set to 10 the y register here is set to 10 now that was our counter when we were counting the digits as we pushed them onto the stack if you look at where we are in the assembly um, we're right here at this decrement Y so we've pulled a digit off the stack and that's the that's the one that's in right here and then we jumped to um, the best out routine which prints a prints a digit and we can't see it because Let's see. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be showing up there. Oh, that's going to be another issue. That's something else I just thought of. When we print the digit, we don't want to print the. We want to print a one, an actual one. A, you know, a, the digit one. Well, that's not the same thing as the code one. Um, so we need to go back to our book here and find the um, the screen codes and that might be a little hard to find let's see uh, it's probably in the appendices 
should probably be using. I, I have two versions of this. One of them is scanned in. This is the scanned in one, which is more accurate because you can actually see the pages. Um, the other one is OCR'd, which means it has quite a few um, errors in it. But um, Okay, here we are. ASCII codes. So, yeah. So we want to print... To print an actual one, we want to print the number 49. So every digit, every numerical digit is its value plus 48. So we want to, when we pull this off the um, stack then, we want to add, well first we have to clear the carry, and then add with carry 30, which 30 in hex is 48 in uh, decimal. So we want to add that and then jump to the print routine and come back. All right. So let's go out. Let's assemble again. Load. And go to 1300. All right. And then start stepping. And then go return. Okay, it's still... Now you can see this time, instead of A equals 1, like it was up here, A now equals 3, 1, which is 49 in decimal. So if we go to the... It just hangs there. Okay, so we still have issues. Or... Yeah, we still have some issues. Oh, it, it actually worked. I just had, I think, it, apparently because um, because I'm using the other monitor, it uh, it breaks into the monitor, and then I had to come back here to see what it actually printed out. So it actually did work. It printed out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Um, to make this a little nicer, so it's easier to tell what's going on. Let's get the code for return, which is 13. <clears throat> Come back here. And let's go up to the top. <clears throat> and load A with, with D, which is 13 in hex. And JSR to bass out. Okay, that's going to print a, a carriage return so that it's not running into the last stuff that we printed. Okay, what I do? Unknown operator. What am I staring at that I'm not getting? I'm not getting something. Line 13. Uh, oh, I guess I needed to tell that it was hex. I can never... Uh, the the built-in monitor on the 128 just assumes hex by default. <clears throat> I guess this assembler doesn't. So, anyway, that's fine. So if we look at the top of the <clears throat> program then, <clears throat> we can see that show up here now where we load A with D, jump to the, the bass out subroutine at FFD2. So now if we go to the actual 128, um, and why is it? And there it is. I'll have to figure out that's that's a monitor issue why every time I run something I have to go to the monitor and break back out of the monitor before it shows the result. But it works. It prints one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. So that routine then can be used to print any four byte value, any thirty-two bit value. Um oops. 
Okay, so I didn't really expect that to work quite so quickly. I thought there'd be more problems than that, but um, so now we've got a routine that prints a 10 or prints a 32-bit number. Um, I'm going to change this. We'll call it print 32-bit and uh, we'll deal with uh, reorganizing this next time because I haven't really decided how to how to do that but I'm gonna have to be able to pass in an address of any number to print rather than just this one that's actually in the code here at my number so um, we'll deal with that next time um, let's see so we fixed we did this debugging stuff got that all worked out um, I think next I need to figure out kind of where I'm going with this project um, a couple of ideas I've had are either to write a, a full write an operating system it could be a fairly simple one but write an operating system for the Commodore 128 um, another possibility would be some kind of game um, that uses the operating system that's already in it um, I don't know you know I don't really know how many people there who are watching this are using a Commodore or you know Commodore emulator or how many are interested in using the 6502 on other platforms because you know, anything you do in assembly is going to be fairly hardware specific and so when I get into like writing to the screen or anything like that that's going to be fairly specific to Commodore and it's going to be different on other hardware so I don't want to get too far off in the weeds doing all that kind of stuff I'd like to I'd like to keep this where you know anyone who's using a 6502 can get something out of it and I hope that I hope it works out that way um, but I did think about writing um, like maybe a life, uh, maybe life um, to run on the Commodore screen would be sort of a, a medium or you know a smaller project to work on on the way to doing like a full operating system, and then we could write the operating system functions um, or routines as we need them for the game. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking of doing. So I'm certainly interested in feedback if anyone's watching this and uh, you know wants to chime in, has any suggestions on that or you know any requests or questions or anything. I'm certainly open to that. Um, I'm going to keep turning out at least one of these a week from now on. Now that I've got the monitor figured out, um, that's going to save some some time and trouble. Um, <clears throat> it certainly makes the debugging a lot easier when you can step through your program instead of having to just run it and see if it crashes and then work backwards from there so um, that makes things better um, so yeah that'll be the next step will be kind of to figure out you know if, if I'm gonna do a game of life um, I'm gonna have to write routines that can print characters to locations on the screen so that'd be one routine to be you know, print a character with a location. Um, and then it's hard to say what else. So just see, you know, see what comes or see what we need as it comes. Um, one thing about writing an operating system, you know, I wouldn't necessarily try to write a complete one that like handles cassettes and all sorts of odd, you know, things that they used to have to support back then. It would just be a straightforward basically a, a system with a shell and um, that you can type commands into and I would probably just because of the way I, the way I think I would probably try to be fairly unixy about it although I don't really see um, trying to go multi um, multi-processing with it um, I can't think of the word right now um, preempt multitasking I probably wouldn't try to go multitasking. It's just I'm, a couple people have done that and with some success, but you're really pushing the limits of the system. It wasn't really designed for that. Um, the MMU that's in it that does the memory switching, if it had been done a little bit differently, 
um, it could it would be much easier to do it. But as it is, you just have the one stack, and if you're going to have multiple programs running at the same time and switching, and, and a kernel that switches between them, it's going to have to it's going to have to switch a lot of you know, it's going to have to be banking in and out of memory things and. I don't know. It it would be a big task. It's not it's not impossible because it's been done, um, but it would be a it'd be a big thing to take on. So, I think what I'm going to do is work towards a simple operating system, and then you know who knows what it might evolve into eventually. But and I'm also going to work on a, a life game. Um, if you're not familiar with life, it's just a, a it's a really a simulator. It's not a game, but it's a thing where each cell on the screen. Um, if it has two or three, I think it's if it has two or three neighbors, it grows and um, comes alive. If it has fewer than that or more than that, it dies. And so you get these patterns that grow across the screen as uh, as they as they live. Um, so that'd be something to do um, to kind of give us something to use these routines for. Um, as we go along, so there's something more to, to print on the screen than just numbers. Um, so that's where it stands right now. That was part seven, and uh, with part eight, we'll continue on that. Probably, probably get started on the routine that just prints a character on the screen at a location, and then we can get into uh, programming life and uh, go from there. So I hope if you watch this, you found it interesting, and. Uh, come back for part eight in about a week. Thanks.